No. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Dead But Not. Tonight, we have some very special guests joining us from literally all over the world. Our first guest tonight has quite the temper, so let's make some noise for Joseph Stalin. Uh... Hey, how's it going? How's your son doing? Ugh, he's still alive. He tried shooting himself in the air the other day, but missed. He can't even shoot. Oh, um, that's nice. Uh, anyways, you've been always known for being a great leader, especially of the Soviet Union, specifically. Not that you did the most wonderful things while being the leader of the Soviet Union, but I was wondering precisely what you were affiliated with before that. Ugh, I stole money, robbed banks, got exiled to Serbia, and killed people. Nothing special. Okay, um, next question. Uh, during your glorious reign, what was your best memory? <laughs> <laughs> My best memory was defeating Hitler at the Battle of My City, Stalingrad. I loved watching the blood pour from the eyes of the Germans as they tried crawling away. Speaking of that, why did you hate Hitler so much? Are you kidding me? He betrayed me! Non-aggression packed my butt! Do you think you had any effect on Russia? I most certainly did. Russia went from an agricultural piece of crap to an industrial economic power. I'm great. Also, I heard you tried to turn Russia communist. Um, did that work as planned? Yes, it did. Um, well, how about communism itself? Did that work well for your country? <laughs> well, communism in in Russia, um, well, um... Why don't you stop Stalin, Stalin? <laughs> get to the next question! Okay. Try to get you in a better mood. What were your concentration camps like? Uh, they were beautiful. The conditions were terrible. I loved it so much. Uh, what was your favorite part about being a Russian leader then? I loved being in full control. Everything that I wanted to happen, happened. Every person I wanted dead, died. It was great. Okay, um... So I suppose nobody could escape your wrath in that case. Okay, so what made you most want to change your original last name, Dezabagashanini, We just to- And first of all, you need to pronounce it those Hagashini. Get it right. Okay, uh, so we're gonna switch the subject here a bit and um, talk about uh, Hitler again. We know you remember that guy. Uh, <clears throat> do you consider yourself better or worse than Hitler? Hitler was bad, but I was better. Is that, is that all you have to say on the subject? That is all I want to say on the subject. Well, how about how many people he killed versus how many people you killed? And what is your definition of bad, Sir Stalinist? Hitler killed a lot. I killed a lot. Plus more. So. For our final question, I'd like to um, ask a little more on the subject of a hybrid species of half-man, half-monkey that you attempted to create in order to um, enhance and expand your army. Could you please enlighten us on the subject? Yes, I did attempt to create a species of half-monkey, half-man, but the chromosomes did not work out, so it didn't work. Okay, and how did you go about managing that project? I hired the scientist but he didn't manage to do it, so let's just say he got removed. I suppose it would be difficult running such a large and intensive program when you're so busy yourself rushing about. No! Hello, and welcome back. Our next guest has had an amazing influence on our knowledge of astronomy today. Let's all give a warm welcome to Copernicus. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How have you been? Been fabulous. Thank oh, you very that much. is very good. And dead. Oh yes. So you've always been known for having some pretty unique ideas on the structure of our solar system. What made you have interest in space? 
Well, I have always been interested in space ever since I was a child, but in all throughout college, I studied lots of different sciencey things like earth science, astronomy, mathematics, and physics. Ah, yes. So what did you do after college? After college, well, my uncle really wanted me to become a doctor of law, but instead, I was pretty disappointed when I told him that I wanted to be an astronomer. Mm, yes, I understand. Where did you connect most of your studies? Every night, I would go outside and observe the sky. Um, uh, okay. But knowing that you died 20 years before Galileo and proved the telescope, how did you observe anything? God damn it, size for a reason, young lady. Alrighty, next question. How did you convince the people that the sun was was in the center of the universe? Well, it wasn't until after I died that people finally realized I was right. The church accepted my theory in the year of 1620. Ah, good for you. Speaking of your death, how exactly did you die? I died of a stroke. Nothing special. Oh, oh, and did you have any family? I actually did not have a wife or children. I considered myself married to science. It was a very lonely life. Mr. Lonely. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, you couldn't have done this alone. Did you have anyone assist you? Actually, I did. I did conducted most of my studies with a good friend of mine, an Italian astronomer named Nirvana. Oh, I see. Did religion have any role in your studies? It did, actually. In the Bible, it states that the Earth does move and does not stand still. So, whatever the Bible says is what God says, and whatever God says must be true. Okay, last question. Tell us something interesting about yourself that not everybody knows. I have a chemical element named after me called Copernicum. Pretty oh. cool. Yes, very, very cool. All right, well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the show. Our next guest tonight is, or should I say was, an amazing naval captain. He went all the way to Japan, but we'll get to that later. So please welcome Matthew Perry. Hi, how's it going? Thank you. All right, so let's jump right in. So, Perry, how did you get involved in the Navy at such a young age? Well, both my father and brother were involved in the Navy since I was a young boy. Well, what did you do to help the Navy at such a young age? I did things like helping to advance the U.S. Navy in New York and talking about changing our ships from sailboats to steamboats. Oh, well, why did you join the Navy? It must be a really hard job. Well, you see, I joined so I was able to help my country and its people. Oh, that's a really nice thing you did. So, what was your favorite part about being a part of the Navy? Being able to meet the president, of course. President Miller Fimbri was giving me the order to go to Japan. Really? You got to meet the president? Why was he ordering me to go to Japan? Oh yes, about that. It was to be able to open up trade with them. And then when they refused, I forced them to begin trading with us. It made me feel powerful. Oh, okay. Well, moving right along. Did you fight in any wars while enlisted? Yes, actually I did. I fought in the War of 1812 at the Battle of Lake Erie. Oh, I've never heard of that battle before. That's what everyone says. Okay, um, well, let's calm down now and change the subject. So, Perry, what influence do you think you made on uh, the world? Well, are we still trading with Japan today? I think that's enough influence. Um, oh, all right, oh, a little bit of a touchy subject, so let's keep moving on. Let's go all the way back. When did your naval career start? Oh, the good old days. It all started the day I turned 15. Oh, oh, Perry, let's get to the point. I began at age 15 on my brother's boat. Ah, oh, yes, of course. What skills did you learn from being in the Navy? I became a skill leader and captain. Okay, then, um, we only have time for one more question today. What were some struggles during the Navy? I have none. All right, that's all the time we have tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, let's clap it up for Matthew Perry. Bye. 
Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the show. Our next guest tonight comes all the way from Italy and played an important aspect in the Renaissance period. So please, let's have a warm welcome for Machiavelli. Oh, sorry, was I supposed to go in that way? I, I, I do it if you want. Okay, so hi, it's nice to have you, nice to have Hello, you. Hello, it's nice to have you too. Okay, I mean, thank so, you for having me. So, Mr. Machiavelli, to enlighten those who may not know you, could you please tell us what you're best known for? Oh, uh, well, I would say I'm best known for being one of the most influential political theorists of Western philosophy. Oh, um... Especially during the Renaissance period. Okay, um, so what sort of things did you do to earn this title? One of my most famous works was a treatise called The Prince. Uh, it outlines to a young pupil of the Medici family how to gain and maintain political power. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. So, how exactly do you believe one is to go about doing this? Well, The Prince states that it is mostly centered around the idea of having a correct balance of fortune and the virtue. Oh, I think I should read that. Yeah, this is very good. Are you German now? Anyways, Sorry. are there any more books or texts that you have written? Why, yes, I've wrote many of my ideas and observations on different countries' political theories throughout the year. I also wrote discourses and some comedic poems and comedies. They are very, very funny. <laughs> okay, awesome. That's, that's really nice. Moving on, so where did you spend most of your life? Well, I grew up and spent most of my adulthood um, in Italy. Florence, to be exact, um, and uh, that's where the Medici family made most of the ruling. Okay, did, was there any conflict going on in Florence at the time? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, during the early 1500s, popes would wage war against Italian city-states. In 1499, Florence restored a republic in which the Medici family was exiled. Oh, did do you have any part in that? Yes, uh, during the time I served in many government positions in Florence and was even responsible for the Florentine militia. Oh, very important position. Yeah, yes, we, oui. cheers, prego. Okay. Indeed. <laughs> okay, did you face any challenges during your life? Well, the Medici family returned and I was imprisoned for conspiracy against them and tortured me as well, but I was released after three weeks. I suppose it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Agreed. Oh, yes. Uh, did you have a family at any time throughout your life? Uh, yes, actually. In 1502, I married Marietta Cossini and had four sons and two daughters. Okay, and for our last question, if you were so influential on Florence through the government, why did you turn to writing? Um, well, after the whole imprisonment and torturing thing, the Medici family didn't believe me that I was a good man. I was still suspected since they had suspicions about me. So they wouldn't allow me to make even the little appointment with them, so I turned to writing instead. And what an influence those writings have had on the rest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Machiavelli. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And we're back. Our next guest is quite the traveler. He's almost been all around the world, but we'll talk about that later. Please make some noise for Ferdinand Magellan. Welcome, welcome. It's wonderful to have you. Yeah, oh, hello. It must be nice to have me too. Yes, okay. You've always been known to be a great explorer, but what did you do before that? Ah, oh, yes, at a very young age, I studied map making and navigational skills, you know, always top of my class. Oh, fascinating. How did that help you with your travel slash career as an explorer? Well, you sort of need a map to go places. True, but your most famous exploration, you were going across the Atlantic Ocean and you didn't know what you would find, so why would you need a map for that? Well, I made one. Oh, well... Speaking of the expedition, there is some controversy as to whether you should be credited with being the first to circumnavigate the globe. Were you actually the first to cross the whole world in a ship? Of course I was! What are you talking about? Well, wasn't there that time when you were being chased off a beach by a bunch of angry natives? With spears and stuff after you tried converting them? Well, 
Yeah, I tried converting them to Christianity, but that didn't work out. Yeah, well, typically people don't like foreign people showing up on their doorstep and trying them to tell them what to believe. Well, I thought it was my personal duty as a Christian explorer to spread my faith throughout the world. Oh, well, uh, speaking of religion, what was one of the reasons for your exploration? Well, yes, religion was, but also was the BOOP! So, back to the whole circumnavigation thing. How do you feel about a lot of people not believing you were the first to cross the entire world? Hey, Olya, you are a bachatismosa. No me gusta.